All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ozma Khan, and I'm the campus recruiter uh, here at Mercer. Thank you all for taking the time to attend our Government Health Business Early Career Panel today. Uh, I will be the moderator for the call, and we also have Stacy Betts, um, who will be helping out. Stacy, if you want to do a quick wave and introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm with Mercer Government, and I am the business's campus recruiting lead nationally. So if you do apply for any of our positions, uh, I'll be your hiring manager and the person you would have your first interview with. Uh, so with that being said, I am located in Phoenix, and I've been with Mercer over 20 years. So, Osma? Okay. Um, I'm going to go over some quick housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we would love to see your beautiful faces, so uh, feel free to keep your videos on if you choose. Everyone's mics are currently muted, um, and we ask that you keep yourself on mute for the duration of the introduction or, or quick little um, intro portion. There will be time for Q&A, and we encourage you to unmute yourself and ask the panel questions. And of course, you can also ask questions in the chat box. Uh, the, the panel today is super excited to answer your questions about growing up in the government health practice and any other job related questions you may have. Um, and if you have any recruiting related questions, process, eligibility, applications, et cetera, feel free to private message myself or Stacy, and we will do our best to get those questions answered. Following the presentation, um, I will reach out to all of you with some additional Mercer resources and a link to today's recorded session. Now let's get the session started. Uh, as I said, we have some great panelists here today who are excited to chat with you. Um, Charles, I'm going to pass it on to you to kick off the session. Yeah, thanks, I appreciate it. Welcome everybody. Um, what we have today is just to focus on our newer Mercer members. Um, I myself have been with Mercer for about nine years now. Um, I didn't start out of college, but I came shortly after it, a short stint with the state for six years, um, and then came into Mercer and have moved my way through the ranks to a client leader, um, having started out as a, kind of a senior analyst, um, which is a couple years into your career. Um, but what we have for you today is um, some conversations from our newer hires, um, a more recent experience that's more akin to yours. Uh, Brian, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Brian Farley. I have been with Mercer um, for about two and a half years. I uh, work out of the Minneapolis office. Um, so I'm, I live here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I do not come directly out of college. I started in the finance field, so came from there. Um, and I'm also uh, so I'm an analyst, but non-actuarial analyst. So we kind of split. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit, but um, that's me. Yeah, sure thing. So hello and ev welcome everyone. So uh, my name is Philip McElborough. I am based out of the Phoenix office. I've been with Mercer Government and Health for two and a half years. Um, so a little bit about me prior to joining Mercer and I'll go into what I do now. So um, prior to joining Mercer in 2018, um, I was living in England. I had my master's in mathematics. Uh, fortunately, I got to spend a year of that in America, uh, studying at the University of Arizona. Um, once I left college, I had two years in sort of consulting um, prior to moving over here. Once I uh, moved over here in 2018 and uh, was then looking for my first step in a career in, a career in the US, um, I made a sort of a list of things I was looking for. So uh, for me, my sort of big key pieces I was looking for in my sort of first uh, job in the US was, uh, first of all, I, want, I wanted to be in consulting. Uh, I wanted something with uh, great growth opportunities, you know, stuff that, um, you know, firstly, stuff that could um, give me uh, growth opportunities. So stuff towards, um, you know, further education, uh, you know, potentially, you know, becoming credentialed. I want the opportunity to become more client facing, developing my business acumen and something, you know, a company where I could eventually one day, you know, help pull in new business. Um, other key aspects I was looking for, I want something that was challenging, you know, something that was going to stimulate me on a day-to-day -day basis. And then from my previous consulting jobs, I knew things that I, was, I liked and did not like. So uh, my previous consulting work, um, 
missed out on some of the statistical and data-driven uh, approaches that I've now found in MRSA. And then, um, you know, I think other key things I was looking for was potentially sort of a small, smaller and more dynamic teams. And uh, for me, you know, you can have one or the other. You, you can have, have job stability or these small, dynamic, agile teams. However, you know, once I had discovered MRSA and started talking with a few folks that worked here, um, I identified that, hey, you know, people are actually working in these, you know, smaller groups working on uh, specific clients. So I work on the, the Massachusetts client and I have done for the two and a half years that I've been here. But um, yeah, that was the story of what I was looking for and how I discovered uh, Mercer and uh, some of the, the key um, pieces I was looking for. And, you know, Mercer has fulfilled for me in these two years. Um, very some Charles started as sort of a, an analyst, senior analyst. Um, however, you know, over my two and a half years, I've grown to become uh, client facing and take on some project management work. But we can go into more details later. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Mitra Olatayo. I am, I've been with Mercer for, it's going on just about four years, um, upcoming in March. Um, just to give you some background. Well, first, I'm based in the Atlanta office, obviously home office right now, but <laughs> in the Atlanta area. And uh, just to give you some background, I was in the financial industry prior to Mercer just for a couple of years, kind of working my way through grad school and still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and so while I was there, um, I got introduced to kind of this idea of consulting and kind of non-traditional consulting um, and it really grabbed my attention. So that's how I ended up at Mercer. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to be here and talk to you guys today and hopefully we get a lot of good questions. I think Adi, I think Stacy's audio is having trouble right now. Yeah. What we can go ahead and do is um, we can start taking questions whenever. One of the things that I uh, wanna do is give you kind of a broad idea of what it looks like to start your career in Mercer um, and kind of progress through it. And I think we've got um, some good examples of, of coming in, you know, not necessarily new to your career, um, but coming in fairly early in your career and looking how it talked. As Philip talked about earlier, you know, uh, most of our analysts come in and they work through progressions of becoming a senior analyst, meaning they have the technical expertise to be able to reproduce and work within the teams, um, but then also evolve into project management and some client facing responsibilities. Um, Philip, can you talk a little bit about um, what it was like as you took on the, the initial analyst expectations, um, but then kind of directed your career in a way that allowed you to start taking on more client facing work and more PM work? Yeah, certainly. So um, I imagine like a lot of people in Mercer, you don't um, set out, you know, you don't go out looking to be working in Medicaid consulting. Um, you have like me, the, those key attributes I was looking for in a job and I was looking to develop. So um, part of that sort of onboarding process for me was uh, developing the, the knowledge around Medicaid and the, the health sector. So I don't know, I believe that I came in with some of the technical aspects for a lot of the sort of model development that we're doing, we do, and sort of the, the rate development process that we go through. However, you know, there was a lot of background knowledge I had to, you know, work on to uh, develop. And so, so when I first joined, I think the big part of um, getting involved in Mercer and, you know, over two and a half years, being in a position where I could then lead on some of this work is really, you know, tapping into the, the knowledge base that we have within Mercer. So uh, certainly working with great people and um, absorbing the no wealth of knowledge that they have in order to um, develop a sort of good fundamental understanding of my client in Massachusetts to then build upon that and uh, sort of really take lead on some of that, that work and be able to communicate that with, uh, with our client. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things that you talked about there that I think is really important is about learning in, in uh, a cohort um, and coming in and becoming part of a cohort. Most of our cohorts within the government group are centered around state and state clients. Myself, I'm a client leader for three different states, Washington, Connecticut, and Oregon within the practice. Um, and within that, I have different cohorts of analysts that do different projects. 
Um, but one of the things, and, and you know, I'll, I'll kick it back over to the panel to, to talk about what they've experienced in, in terms of teamwork and kind of growing in a cohort. Um, and growing in the cohort kind of ensures that your skill level um, you know, keeps up with everybody else um, and really helps you graduate through the different technical aspects that you get into. Um, but I'll let Brian speak to it and make sure that however, however you guys want to talk about the cohorts and what that meant to you um, as you, you know, kind of spent the last couple of years at Mercer's. Yeah, um, I, I've been lucky enough to be on two teams uh, the whole time, two and a half years here. So I work on our North Carolina and District of Columbia clients. And yeah, coming in, um, like Mitra from the financial industry, it was kind of a shock, just uh, everything that was different in healthcare and Medicaid and the data we worked with was very different from financial data and things like that. But having the same group to work with and not just thrown into a large company um, was very helpful because you know where everyone's at really quickly and you kind of use everyone's expertise. And most people that come in are on multiple teams. Um, there are some people that are just 100% toward one and that works too. But with two, you know, they're shaped a little bit differently. You have different leaders on the teams, you have different analyst levels. Um, and then as you kind of grow and understand the business, so not only as we talked about, you know, the technical aspect and the modeling and getting all those just hard skills down, also just understanding the bigger picture um, and knowing, you know, you can trust the people that you're going to and having, you know, I had a lot of questions about what we were doing, what it meant and what the impact was. And um, knowing who to ask for those questions was super helpful. Um, also, they're smaller teams for the most part. So you become really comfortable with those people and you kind of ask them anything. So it's just it's a really good way to learn the business quickly. And then before you know it, new people are coming on the team and you're kind of flipping roles and bringing them along. So yeah, I think it's just a really unique way and um, something I wasn't used to, but something I was very glad to have. Mitra and Brian, would you say that's unlike the experience you had outside of Mercer before coming to Mercer? That kind of cohort and the, the, the dependency that you have on your cohort for you know co-learning and shared learning? That's a really good question. Um, I would definitely agree with that. Like the experience that I got uh, coming from the financial industry or just coming from even past positions or, you know, coming straight out of grad school, um, things like that. It, it's a totally different um, environment. And one of the things that I think someone said when I first started was, you know, how do you feel about not being the smartest person in the room? And I was like, I, I love that. I think that's amazing because you're constantly being pushed to learn and to challenge yourself. You're learning, um, you know, skills that will take you a long way in your career, regardless of what you decide to do. Um, and that has a lot to do with the people that you work with um, and all the knowledge and all the skills and all the things that you learn from them just from being alongside them in projects. So I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I agree. And I think that kind of goes before what you learn is, you know, a lot of the stuff is like tips and tricks that you learn all the time between like Excel and different Microsoft Office products or whatever you're doing, just little things to make your job easier, as well as the larger picture things um, about the business. So yeah, just to follow up on that, but I totally agree. Yeah, and so one of the things that that's commonly understood I have to so it was an older guard in consulting is that it's super competitive as an analyst, right? I have family members at Deloitte, um, family members at McKinsey, um, and that the burn and churn mentality is something that is, it was real, at least, you know, when I was younger um, at these consulting firms. We at Mercer, we, we are competitive. We are still, you know, competitive as analysts, but um, how we succeed is different from those models where you get used for 300 hours on one project and then nobody else you know, you won't work with them again. Um, Immersor has teams that go through cycles of learning and cycles of, you know, busy times. I um, mean, I think, you know, they end up growing together as opposed to being competitors and real cutthroat. Um, I don't know if you guys would agree with that sentiment, but that's what I see in my teams. Oh, yeah, 100%. I'm actually, you know, talking about the, the cyclical nature of our work, you know, for, for me, this early part of the year is perhaps in my lull and you know right now we're focusing on on onboarding a uh, a cohort of students uh or um new uh, college hire analysts so right now i'm working on presentations that you know i received you know two years ago and i'm now the one you know delivering those presentations and bringing 
up our, our new analysts. So yeah, I definitely um, uh, would uh, emphasize your point there, Charles, with, you know, definitely learn together, grow together. And, you know, there's certainly times when I'm going through it, I'm like, okay, well, actually, I just learned something new for the first time, you know, two and a half years in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, unless there's something else that we want to add to, um, we can go ahead and take this opportunity to kick it over to our guests um, and let them ask some questions. Um, you can do it either in the chat box or you can um, just go ahead and, and I believe unmute yourself, Ozma. Yeah. Yeah, you guys can just unmute yourself, be bold, be brave, and ask a question. Uh, hello, I'm Ritika Madhavan. I am a business data analytics junior at ASU. And I was wondering, so in such a fast paced environment and a cyclical work nature, at what point did you decide that you are ready for the next step in your career? That's an awesome question. I, I'd like to go ahead and take a stab at that because I find myself kind of transitioning into kind of that next step now. Um, it, I would say it's kind of a natural progression where, you know, the whole goal is to make sure that, yes, we may have cyclical work, but the whole goal is to make sure that you have new opportunities, new challenges, new projects, new things that you're exposed to constantly. Um, and one of the great things that I've tapped into now is kind of expressing those things and saying like, hey, I'm, I'm more interested in, you know, uh, project management and the budget side of things. How can I get involved? I literally expressed that interest maybe four months ago and I've been doing it for the past four months. Um, so it's just, it's awesome that, you know, you get to tap into those things. So it's almost like you, if you don't know where you wanna go, it's nice because you get to try different things along the way once you kind of get that foundational um, aspect down. But if you do know, you can express your interest and say, hey, I'd like to you know, maybe work on some projects on this uh, different aspect and more than likely you will get that opportunity. So it, I, I really like that aspect about the career part of it. Thank you. I think I saw someone raise their hand and you can just unmute yourself and ask. Is that you, Jake? Or I think Rennie was first. Okay. Toggling between two screens. Hi. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Um, so my question is actually directed at Philip. Um, so you mentioned uh, about um, coming to the US from England. And I'm wondering if uh, the health system obviously there is quite different from the American system. I'm Canadian myself, so the system I'm familiar with is much more aligned with the system you come from. Were you able to leverage that in the work that you do now? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so m my knowledge, obviously, yeah, I've certainly utilized National Health Service in the UK and had experience of using it. I had never, actually at any point taking a critical look at the National Health Service and, you know, developed an understanding. So really when I say I was like new to healthcare within, uh, when I came to Mercer, it was really, you know, starting with a, a blank slate for me and um, yeah, learning the US system from the ground up. I, I don't know if there was any specific pieces that I was able to leverage per se. Thank you. Okay. Um, I had a question. So I got my undergrad in like healthcare administration. So I understand the whole like Medicare and Medicaid parts really what I like more than like pro uh, private insurance and everything like that. And then I'm in my master's program right now for finance. So the government health financial analyst position really interests me, but I'm trying to get a better understanding of like what you guys focus on. Cause like, I know like there was like $178 billion going to like healthcare workers for funding because they weren't getting the money they needed because there wasn't enough uh, emissions and then COBRAs being extended and the subsidies with that. So like, do you guys work along stuff like that or more towards just strictly like state-based levels when it comes to like, you know, Arkansas health and wellness, Pennsylvania health yeah. and wellness, like things like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We do have some exposure to the federal programs that are happening, but mostly it's state-based within the government group. Um, we really are attached to our clients. Um, you know, we have large contracts with, with different states 
And within that state, there's an, a, any number of activities we perform for them. Um, for example, in Connecticut, um, which doesn't have managed care, um, we set up a PCMH program that has care coordination elements with it. Um, we do financing, we do informatics for them, but it's all to the end of delivering health benefits to their Medicaid members. Um, so I'd say that's probably 90% of our business. Um, within that, it's not just setting rates um, for the managed care companies. Um, we do a lot of pharmacy stuff and we do a lot of clinical stuff. All of that is derived from policy that comes from the federal level um, within the Affordable Care Act, within the Support Act. Those types of things dictate how states are gonna to respond to delivering care um, to not only their Medicaid popula population, but their other indigent populations, whether it's state only covered um, or the behavioral health, which is often separate of that system. Um, so we see the federal edicts come down and we kind of intervene and consult at that level to translate that into actual operations um, for the delivery of the benefits to the Medicaid member. Um, but we have um, of late kind of tapped into some of the more federal programs and the federal consulting where you see more things like that. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jake and I'm a junior studying mathematics and I come from a pharmacy background and I recently switched into actuarial background. And the question I have is what makes the government actuarial summer intern uh, different from uh, like PNC and other different actuarial internship position? Is it just the whole Medicaid, Medicare stuff or is there something different that uh, you guys didn't share yet? Do we have Stacy back on? She would probably be best to answer that. It, let's see, is my mic working now? Yeah, there you go. Okay, good, good. Sorry about that. Um, so did I understand, Jake, that you asked what makes our um, internship program different than a traditional, you know, a traditional actuarial analyst position? Is that what you asked? Yeah, both Mercer and like the whole government itself, I guess. So, yeah, I think, you, Jake, you were looking at two different spots. One was just a, a summer intern. The other was an actuarial analyst intern. Um, and then talking about that, if, if that's actually two different tracks um, or if it's just an internship exposure to the usual business. Okay, thanks. So our interns will come in and do the same job as a full-time analyst. So you're doing the same exact work. So I suppose, I mean, I can't speak to what everybody else's program looks like, but um, from, you know, your internship, you'll, you'll put in a team just like, you know, Brian, Phil, and, and Mitra have talked about, you'll do actuarial work. Um, perhaps you'll be on a rate setting project. You could be on you know, a different type of project. I think what makes government, the type of work we do unique for an actuarial analyst is that, you know, if you go to work for a health plan, you're, you know, maybe you're working in pricing or reserving or, you know, some other specialty. Um, we kind of have all of those baked into each position. So you get exposure to all of the pieces of the business. You're not just limited to one segment or another, if you will, even though of course we're all within the health sphere. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you, you know, further or really anybody further about any more specific questions. But did that help, Jake, a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Perfect. Great. Thanks and for Jake, if you're, Yeah, Jake, if you're seeing something that is two different things, um, it may be two different groups that you're looking at, um, and just engage Stacy or, or somebody else, and they can help you figure out if that's uh, internship within the government group or an internship without it outside so all the government ones will say government in the title but there is an actuarial an analyst intern and then there's a financial analyst intern if you are pursuing the exams you'd be in that actuarial analyst um, segment okay hi um, my name is Tamara I'm a senior um, at Rutgers and I'm interested in the financial analyst position um, so I just wanted to know what your experiences were with training for the job and how you think that, you know, made you prepare for the job. Yeah, I would say, or, sorry, um, uh, with, with the training, the training program is very comprehensive um, when you kind of come on and it's not all at once. I mean, you start working pretty quickly. Um, you know, you're, you're in the weekly team meetings with with whatever state group you're, you're working with. Um, so you kind of get that on overall understanding kind of dripping in right away. Um, and then there's specialized training for each of the different pieces. I would say it, it's definitely, it's set up well where you get a lot of training and you know you get the pharmacy piece and how that's interrelated with what you're doing. You get your specific 
rate setting program to your state and how that works, the history of it, the background, that stuff's all useful because it all impacts how you do your work moving forward and what the what perspective the state is coming from. Um, in most cases, there is, you know, there's, there is a lot and you don't, you're not going to be an expert right away. Um, you kind of take in certain things that maybe you're more geared to just knowing you kind of know most of it already and you kind of perfect that and then you learn the rest just kind of as you go. And that's, um, you know, I've only been here for two and a half years, but I don't anticipate that ever stopping. Um, it's, there's enough to, enough nuances in different states and all this that you just kind of learn throughout the entire process. And I mean, I, I can honestly say I've learned something every single day I've been here. Um, but the training program does give you a nice head start. And there is a couple of weeks for you to just digest all that and kind of go off on your own. Um, if you want to go down like specific path and learn more about that, there's, there's time for that. So hopefully that helped. No, definitely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi there, my name is Patrick. Uh, I had a question about the peer review process. I understand it plays a major role in a lot of the uh, a lot in the analyst evaluation process. Can you describe that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. And let's, um, go ahead. Let's, no, let's take that a couple of different ways because the peer review process is is everything. It's the core of what we do. I mean, if it's not if it's not going through the peer review process, it's not leaving our desks. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different levels that it happens at, you know, at, at my level, at the client leader level, there's peers that happen. Um, and then at the analyst level, there's peers that happen. Um, so let's go ahead and take it in two chunks. First, we'll talk about the, the peer review and what being part of a peer review process means as an analyst, because um, it is a large process um, that you are either part of a, a driver, a, a builder, or a peer reviewer. Um, so I'll, I'll kick it over to our panel to, to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I'll wrap us up talking about what peer review means in terms of client retention and making sure that the Mercer brand stays how it is and how that matters. Philip, if you want to go ahead and talk a little bit about your experience, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. No, no problem. So yeah, the peer uh, review process, definitely one of our big value adds and regards to like how that looks uh, when you're working as part of a team. So um, you'll typically, it's how it's served in Massachusetts, you'll have a project lead and they will work on, they will oversee the entire task and they will find, you know, two, two analysts to work on that task independently. So let's, for example, take uh, the idea of trend. So each um, individual will develop their analysis with the same goal in mind and same sort of template. However, you know, each of them work independently. And then at the end, the, the live would send it across to the peer and the peer would then compare results. And, and that's where you sort of really open the floor up for discussion, be like, oh, I did it this way because I felt that it was uh, you know, more appropriate or you know, I used this formula, but we got the same result, we did it in different ways. And really um, it's making sure that we're recovering uh, all aspects of the analysis. And then once, you know, peer and live um, concur on a result, they'll then send it up to the, the consulting or task lead, and they will do sort of the, the further breakdown and make sure, you know, this is ready to, you know, go out or, you know, let's have our actuary look over this. And then, you know, that's, that's the process for getting um, a, a deliverable out to our client and making sure it's gone through the peer review process. Thanks, Philip. Mitra, Brian, is there anything that you want to add to that in your experience in the peer process? Um, just to piggyback off of that, a lot of the times too during that discussion that Philip mentioned, there's also methodology questions, right? So from year to year, you may always do an analysis one way, but then maybe through that peer review process, you discover, well, maybe there's a different way, a better way that we should be, you know, looking at things. So every year there's always room for imp uh, improvement even if it is one of those analyses that you do all the time. So just another thing to add. Yeah, and I think, you know, what Mitra is touching on there, what's notable about the peer review process is it pushes us further. It keeps us out in front of the pack. Um, and that, you know, as, as the cohort grows and as we produce products, 
the peer review process every time will give us something new and something better to offer the client as a product or a deliverable. Um, one of the things that we have to be able to do when we put something out is say that it's been thoroughly looked over and that angles haven't been missed. Because what happens is errors lead to lawsuits, leads to liability, right? Um, principally, um, it, it, it leads to embarrassment um, in our clients, right? If, if a government group puts out Medicaid numbers or something that's wrong because we, we didn't peer review it well enough, um, then the Medicaid director, the state governor's office, the legislatures are all gonna end up with egg on their face. Um, and that is, we're in the business of, of blocking and tackling for them, making sure that they don't end up embarrassed. Um, so, you know, at my level, the peer review process gives us confidence that we're not going to put anything out on behalf of our client that's going to embarrass them or put them in a position of disadvantage with anybody, whether that is, you know, um, the state's lawyers or, you know, auditors or even, you know, members directly. Um, you know, we're trying to minimize member complaints and things like that. And the peer review process, the peer review process lets us do that. Um, and, you know, of note, the peer review process isn't just numbers, it's ideas. Um, you know, if you have an idea or a solution for something, um, even if you're not an actuary, I'm not an actuary, I'm a lawyer by trade um, and a behavioral health specialist by training, um, I go with concepts of how to deliver care better um, and possibly the policies that could support that. I go to my peers and I get them to peer review my concepts before it even leaves my mouth to my client. Um, so the peer review process really is the catalyst to the communication that happens among the team members um, to derive the solution or the, the, the product that gets to our client eventually. Um, and I think that's what distinguishes Mercer from a lot of other firms. A lot of other firms will spend a negligible amount of time on peer review, um, interconnecting, cohort learning, and all these things that assure that whatever we say is to the best of our knowledge. Um, whereas that's the point of emphasis in everything we do and everything we build out. We start from, you know, how is this gonna get peered? And then we get to whatever the solution is. Um, is there anything else that we should say about peer review? Um, it's, it is a consuming aspect of, of your early career, um, but it's, it's super important, both from a learning aspect and, you know, just CYA and insurance perspective. All right, well, hi there. Um, I'm Casey Gustina. I'm a senior actuarial science student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And my question is uh, looking at those people who work on the teams or cohorts, as you guys say, um, what characteristics do you consistently see exemplified by the team members who really succeed and grow a lot professionally, intellectually while in that team setting? That's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, you get all kinds of different technical expertise and industry knowledge and that kind of stuff, but really it is just the attitude and being willing, especially, um, early on in the career, just being willing to step up and take on maybe some tasks that others don't want to do um, or, you know, that aren't as popular. And then just trying to dig deep and learn um, about each of those tasks as you do them. So a lot of times it's easy to, you know, you get an Excel file, the task is, you know, conceptually it's in depth, but um, in what you're actually doing, it's just updating a model. Um, in this example, it can be, maybe it's easy and you just kind of go through it don't understand what you're doing, move on to the next task. You're not really learning anything there. So it's kind of digging into that, maybe doing the task correctly, but also asking, hey, like, I want to dig in here a little bit. Like, what does this actually mean for our overall process? Like, how does this impact the rates as a whole and things like that? And just that that, learn, that drive to learn more um, will put you in better spots to then take on larger responsibilities as you go. And that just compounds uh, throughout your career. So I'd say, yeah, just the attitude going in. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is, um, you know, as you come in, you may not, you may not quite grasp the, the, the just wideness of what, what we do. So you'll be defining your career track, but no matter which direction you go, and I've had analysts come in um, and eventually become subject matter experts, um, project managers, um, switch to do just informatics, data analyst stuff, um, and data management. Um, but any way it goes, you have to come in wanting to be uh, a part of the team and learn as a team because nobody does it by themselves. Nobody, nobody gets from analyst to senior analyst to client lead without being successful in numerous teams over different settings and different projects. A um, hundred times over, you know, probably through the year, I don't know how many projects you cycle through and how many teams, 
but the ones that are successful in all those environments and contributing and learning and taking something from that um, are the people who excel and the people who graduate through the different phases towards leadership and eventually owning projects and then owning clients and owning books of business. Um, but it really is, you know, your success within the team environment um, that I, th I think, you know, plays a key role in your progression and the speed at which you progress, how quickly you can learn those skills. The technical skills will come, you know, but the, the soft skills, working with your teammates, um, you know, grinding it out with your teammates um, and everybody coming out feeling good and the product being great, I think is, you know, part of, part of the success of being a successful analyst. Um, and anybody here, Philip, you, you know, Mitri, they've, they've been through it and they've, they've done it and they have any teams that would invite them back, you know? Um, so I think that's a, that's a key point. And just to add to that too, one, one of the key things for me has been asking questions to better my understanding. So like you always have folks constantly explaining how something works to you or, you know, maybe even giving you background on something. Anytime you don't understand something, it's okay to say, can you explain that one more time or can you explain it differently? I didn't really catch it the first time. Really make sure that you do understand before you kind of move forward. Even if it's something like Brian said, it's something really easy on the outside. Um, just asking that extra question to make sure that you've got the background and understanding will help you in other teams, other projects and all that good stuff. Yeah, maybe we'll pause here. Stacy. I saw some activity in the chat box. Um, but wasn't able to track it. Is there anything that we need to circle back to here? I think I've caught up with all of it. So I've okay. been uh, responding and I think it was doing it too. So I'd say for the live questions, just keep them coming. I think we've still okay. got a couple hands raised. All right. Hello, Matthew Beerman, Arizona State University. Um, with the emphasis on project management, are there any certifications that would be preferred like PMP or uh, Six Sigma? Um, Stacy, if you want the opportunity to talk to that before I do, um, I can. Oh, sure. Um, no, we don't require those, but there are absolutely um, opportunities for folks that are interested in PMP designations to be utilized really successfully on various client engagements. So um, the opportunities are there at this, at this level. Um, it's not something we specifically look for, but it certainly wouldn't be anything we would um, look away from. Did that help you, yeah. Matt? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, and I, I would say I've had several analysts come in with the intention of being a project manager. Um, some took the PMP courses along the way, some haven't. Um, I don't know that it's a determiner of success, but it's certainly you know an opportunity while you're working to, to kind of enrich your, your background um, and you know kind of stack your portfolio. Um, but you know, I, I am a project manager. Um, I was a project manager. Now, I, now I just do client stuff. But um, back then, I, I, nobody asked me to, to get a PMP. They just asked me to learn alongside of the other project managers, um, some of which have PMPs. So um, I'll just put a bookend here, but say um, I know some of you, including Matthew, you were on our session last week where I talked about the choose your own adventure career path, um, and so I would put this kind of in that bucket. Yep. So as you're thinking through your adventure, adventure game of kind of how, what kind of a consultant you want to be, um, if project management consultant is what you're interested in, to Charles's point, you don't have to have a PM to be a project management consultant, but if it's something that you personally are interested in, then it's definitely something you can explore and you certainly have people go for it and complete theirs. Yeah, to, to add on to that, um, you know, that was one of my goals for the year. So every year we kind of set these goals and some of those goals can be, you know, personal, of course, related to the business, of course, like this project management, for example, um, but other goals, you know, throughout your career, whatever your goal is, um, Mercer really does stand behind you and try to support you in those goals. So that was one of my goals last year. And I actually did um, receive my PMP last year. So just keep that in mind too, like, like Stacy said, like, the goal, the, the path is open. So if you're interested in things and they, you know, are relevant to the business, then Mercer is likely going to support you. Yep. Hi, um, my name is Madison and I'm a senior at the University of South Carolina studying international business and finance. But I'm interested in the health informatics analyst position. 
Um, my question is, do the different offices um, specialize in different functions and does the company culture vary from office to office? That's a really good question. Go yeah, ahead. I can, I'm, I will say yes. And I love the diversity of geographical backgrounds of the of our guests today and that um, GHSC is countrywide. We have four main hubs and you probably got that in the 101, um, but that's Atlanta, DC, um, Phoenix and Minneapolis, um, which is quite the spread culturally around our country. Um, and, you know, Mitra being down in Atlanta, it's certainly a different culture, Phoenix. Um, but I think, I think they all combine to, to bring a, a, a kind of diverse background and diverse culture to GHC operating as a core. Um, Mitra, do you have anything to add there? I would agree with that. Um, yeah, like, as he said, there's different, definitely different cultures, just depending on where you are in the country and you know, every team, even our client teams, even if you are in the same office, you know, every team kind of has a, a particular culture as well. But as Charles said, I think it all contributes to the experience and it all contributes to how much you gain from all of those different backgrounds and diverse perspectives. Yeah, just a quick add on for the informatics piece. Um, I, from my experience, I, it seems to me, and I could be wrong, so someone correct me if I'm wrong here, that a lot of the informatics crew is in Phoenix, maybe some in Atlanta. Um, in Minneapolis, we've had one or two informatics folks um, start up in Minneapolis, um, but you know, and they'll kind of travel down Phoenix in normal office times. But typically, it's more the actual financial, actuarial financial group. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's 100% accurate in terms of the Phoenix and Atlanta offices. I'm just speaking from what I've heard. Yeah. yeah we are looking to grow informatics in all three offices. Um, the challenge in, in Minneapolis was we didn't have a lead there for the longest time. And so um, we don't want to hire somebody, um, you know, we value really highly that collaborative environment that we've talked about so far. So that's really been the challenge there. We now have a lead and so we do expect that to grow, um, uh, you know, over the next couple of years for sure there. But it, they are definitely in Phoenix and in Atlanta as well. Yeah. And that is to say, we're all at home now. Um, you know, before that, we had a, a good portion of our GHSC staff that worked remote, um, and they were just attached to offices. Uh, me, for example, I, wor I worked originally in the Phoenix office and then, then went home to Seattle, Washington, um, where I'm still attached to the Phoenix office, part of the actuarial financial group, um, but I interact with all of the offices. Um, DC is primarily policy folks, right, just because it's DC. Um, but they also have actuary financial people there. So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter where you attach as long as you're interacting you know, nationwide with the different groups. And I think there's a, a spot anywhere in any of those offices for any of the sectors. And that's if you wanna be in person. I think the, the culture is shifting and has been shifting in GHSC um, to have teams that have diverse locations. Um, all, the majority of my team members are not located around Seattle or Phoenix for that matter. Um, but we have, we all congeal as, as a team quite well. And I think our culture is setting itself up to be um, just more of that in the future. Hi, I'm Connor McQuillan. I'm a senior studying at the University of Pennsylvania, studying philosophy, politics, and economics. And I was wondering if you could talk about the mentorship program what that's like and maybe any personal experiences any of you may have with it. Stacy, do you want to talk about the, the formal mentoring program that we have a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm going to actually lead into it first and talk about our buddy program, just because I think as a new hire, that's um, really key to your success. So when you first start in, you're given a buddy, somebody that was in your shoes the last year. Um, maybe we hired them last year from college. Um, and they'll be your buddy and somebody that's really you can just kind of go to for questions, really help there to help you kick off and start off correctly. Um, so, but after that, obviously that buddy relationship can last as long as you want. Many of them go on for years and years and years. Um, you'll work with your PM and as you're kind of trying to figure out, you know, kind of your role and your interests and the things that you like to do, um, you'll work with your PM to kind of try to figure out what your crew goals are. And, and during that time, um, you and your PM can talk through some suggestions for a mentor. And then it's up to you to go and ask that individual if they would um, be willing to be a mentor for you. 
um, your PM will kind of vet that so that they'll have an idea if they know that, that person has availability, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's kind of the formal process. And then you'll generally meet with them. You know, monthly is kind of the standard, although everybody kind of has their own ability to drive that to the extent that they want it. Um, but there's also the informal mentoring, and I don't want to discount that. Um, so I mentioned I've been here over 20 years. I've never chosen a formal mentor in my 20 years, um, but I've had a ton of informal mentors of people that know that they are my mentors, even though I don't have anything on paper that says that. Um, and so I go to different ones for different things. Um, you know, if I need to, you know, kind of a swift kick in the pants to kind of just get moving and, and just kind of get my head you know, on straight, then I have those people that will hold that hard line. If I need somebody that's gonna give me a lot of grace, then I've got those people too. So um, the, the ability with our team environment is so collaborative, you are going to have that mentoring constantly, whether you choose formal or informal or both. Hopefully that helped a little bit. I don't know if anybody else has any other thoughts um, based on their perspective. Yeah, I, I personally haven't set up a formal um, mentorship, but I do. Ha I certainly have two mentors that I meet with regularly. Right now, I have a, a project management mentor that I meet with on a on a weekly basis. Just quick 15, 30 minute check ins, just to make sure you know, um, you know, if something came up that prior week, just talking through how it was handled, making sure you know, um, being cons cons as considerate as possible, and you know identifying if there's other ways of handling um, a situation. And then I have more of a, uh, a mentor on one of my uh, client teams. And really that's looking at like, where do I progress? You know, wh what are, what is the next challenge I can take on? You know, how can I um, build, build my role within the team? So that's just a couple of examples of, of informal mentorships that, that I have within, you know, my day-to-day -day life at, at Mercer. Yeah, I, and just to, to put a cap on that, the, the things I would mention is in terms of career guidance, there's lots of different points of contact. It is your people manager, it is the buddy that you get, it is the informal mentors that, that you acquire via your team leads, um, you know, because everybody there is invested in seeing you grow as part of the card. And that's before you get to the client leaders like myself who are watching everybody's career trajectory making sure that we have succession plans, individuals that can turn into team leaders and things like that. Um, so, and that all happens informally. Um, formally, I probably have um, three mentors um, and then probably six at any given time mentees that I do actually follow the script with. Um, but there's dozens of informal mentee relationships that I have with my team leaders. Um, some of which who have you know, followed me around for five years and are now um, becoming client leaders. I just shed one of my states to a longtime mentee um, and she, you know, she's flourishing in it and she's, we've been doing it together for six, seven years. Um, but I mean, those relationships happen inherent to the fact that we grow talent and we nurture talent to take our place um, so that we can go and do something else um, because there is a diversity of things to do and there's always enough work. Um, so you, you kind of, you, you begin to create those relationships, whether you, you consider it formal mentoring or not, it's people that are, that are interested in what your career is, is becoming um, and where it's going and how you're succeeding in it and what you want it to be. Um, we're always looking out to see, you know, are our next wave of senior analysts, team leads, um, whoever, are they happy with the, traje to the trajectory of their, their career? Are they happy in, in the pathway that they're at? Um, and that just circles back to, you know, Stacy's comment about choose your own adventure. It's a collaborative process between you and your leadership, whether that is a senior analyst, a team lead, a client leader, or a practice leader. Um, you know, you are working with all of them to define what your career looks like. Um, and, you know, in the end, it becomes mutually beneficial because they need you to succeed. They need you to step into that next role. That was very helpful. Thank you. Okay, um, awkward silence. Anyone else? Do we have uh, any last questions before we wrap up? It looks like we have a few more minutes. I saw that a question into the chat. Yep. I, I saw that about MMIS and its interaction with the informatics department. 
Um, I don't know if everybody's going to be interested into that because that that gets um that gets pretty technical. Um, but we do do a considerable amount of uh, work with the MMIS. Of course, it feeds all the data that ends up, well, most of the data that ends up with our informatics sector. And the informatics sector cleans the data to interpret it for whatever purpose, whether that is setting rates or creating quality benchmarks to determine the success of the programs. Um, so, you know, the, MSM, the MMIS becomes our primary data feed for the most part. We get aggregated data that's outside of MMIS, but MMIS is really the linchpin of, of our analysts' pile of data to work with. Um, and that's, that's with every state we have a contract with, essentially. Thank you. I just had a, a question as well. Um, I want to ask if any of the work that Mercer does actually leads to any policy change, given all the data that you work with, that that would result in, in any um, legislative impact. That's a great question, Charles. I think that's all you. Yeah, I can take that. Um, I would say on the state level, we see it happen a lot. What we create ends up being um, the impetus for the next legislative movement, whether that is creating a person-centered medical home that ends up driving the legislature to mandate that the state create a value-based purchasing incentive on top of it, which then creates um, this kind of impetus for the legislature to mandate that the state create a monitoring system that ensures that everything that's being delivered in that program is up to par. Um, so what we do, it, it, it does end up cycling because what we do affects the governor's office and then the legislature gets involved and the legislature kind of looks back and say, okay, how can we direct the Medicaid program to do better? Um, at the federal level, we have our policy experts that are, are contributing to um, the national policy kind of think tank or summits um, like the um, National Association of State Health Policy or the National Association of Medicaid Directors. We send people there every year to participate with the Medicaid directors in trying to envision what their landscape looks like. Those types of activities tend to inform federal legislation. Um, we don't necessarily sit beside um, Biden's or you know, Obama's ACA creators, um, but what we do in the space is innovative enough and progressive enough that folks look at it. You know, um, for example, a ACA under Obama was modeled after Massachusetts um, state policy and state programs that was built by consultants. Um, in part by us, we had a hand in it in the beginning. Um, other consultants had a hand in it. So we do create the things that end up being a reference points for federal re legislation most often. Um, we can also call a question. If there's, a, if there's a big flaw in the system, we usually ferret that out, whether that's via data um, or policy analysis or you know, clinical analysis. Um, we're the first ones to see it failing, typically. Um, and we're the first ones that the state governments go to to say, this is failing, we have a problem, can you send your best to try to figure it out? So, and that's, I think that's how the interplay with you know, legislation and policy that comes down is with us. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, if there are no more questions, um, we will wrap it up, unless there's one last one, anyone? I just would like to pop in and say, um, you know, if, if I know this is kind of awkward sometimes to ask questions in this forum. So if anybody has private questions or things you think about later as you're kind of mulling this over, um, I'd be happy to um, talk with anybody else further. Feel free to send me a LinkedIn message. We can chat there um, and um, you know connect. So um, would love to talk with you guys further. Thanks, Stacey. Um, okay, everyone, thank you so much for your time. Panelists, um, you guys were awesome. I hope all the students, you guys were able to get some good information and get some questions answered. I hope you guys all have a great rest of your afternoon. Um, or evening. Um, and we will uh, be in touch soon. I will be sending you guys uh, a link to the session, that the recorded session, um, as well as some other Mercer resources. Um, and, and our position day. deadline is yeah. February 28th on Handshake. So if you are interested in applying and have not yet done so, um, you've got another two weeks or so to get that in. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye.